Uh, my name is Michael Weaver. I'm uh, with Chelsea Green Publishing, and I just want to I want to start by acknowledging and thanking the five bookstores who are co-sponsoring this event: Carmichael's Bookstore, Kitchen Arts and Letters, Northshire Bookstore, Norwich Bookstore, and Water Street Bookstore. So we really appreciate uh, you all uh, co-sponsoring, co-hosting, if you will, this event. And also just a quick uh, caveat or word of apology about the new book, which is why we're all here, Sandor Katz's Fermentation Journeys. Um, the book was supposed to be out by now. I was supposed to be holding it up, a copy in my hands for you to ooh and ah over. And, but it's not. And the reason is that there's been a delay at the printer, which those kind of things are kind of ubiquitous in the book business right now. There are a lot of supply chain issues. And we got word from our printer today that the book has been delayed even a little further than we realized. So we are hoping to have books to the stores by the end of October. And so the good news, the silver lining in this is that you still have time to order the book and get one of that very first batch as it, as it rolls in hot off the press along with a signed book plate if the bookstores still have those remaining. Um, and just a reminder to everyone to be, uh, be kind to your independent bookstores because they're not just dealing with this from us, they're dealing with this from many of the publishers and on many books that they are, that they are expecting in this fall. So do your holiday shopping a little early and, uh, and be kind to your bookstores because it's just one more thing that they're having to deal with on top of everything else. And again, our apologies, uh, but it's unfortunately really outside of our control. A couple of just quick housekeeping notes. We're gonna, Dan and, and Sandra are gonna talk for about 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for question and answers at the end, questions and answers. Um, we will be done an hour after no more than an hour. If you have a question that you'd like to pose, uh, please use the question and answer box uh, at the bottom, ideally rather than the chat. Um, we will try to get to as many of the questions as we can at the end of the presentation. No guarantees that we'll be able to get to all of them, but we'll do what we can. And also a note that this event is being recorded. Uh, it has, the recording has started and and a replay of that will be made available to all of the co-sponsoring bookstores within about a week. So they will presumably share that with you or you can ask them about that or ask us about that. And now just a, a quick introduction of the people that you've really come to hear. Uh, Dan Barber is the James Beard award-winning chef and co-owner of Blue Hill and Blue Hill at Stone Barns in New York. Uh, Barber also co-founded the Row 7 Seed Company, which brings together chefs and plant breeders to develop new varieties of vegetables and grains. And he's also the author of the book, The Third Plate, Field Notes on the Future of Food published by Penguin in 2014, which I just, I wanna put in a quick plug for Dan's book because it's a beautiful book. It's beautifully written. I highly recommend it to anyone who hasn't read it, who's interested in the relationship between sustainable regenerative agriculture and, and good quality food. And I also wanna just uh, express a, a word of thanks to Dan for being here. This is, he'll explain this, I think quickly once we get started, but he's, he's beaming in from Blue Hill and they are just, they're launching their new season there now. So he's extremely busy. And so thanks so much, Dan, for being here. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Sure. Sandor Alex Katz is a fermentation revivalist, a self-taught experimentalist whose explorations in fermentation developed out of his interests in cooking, nutrition, and gardening. He's the author of four previous books, Wild Fermentation, the Revolution Will Not Be Microwaved, The Art of Fermentation, which was a New York Times bestseller and won a James Beard Award, and Fermentation as Metaphor, which was published last year. And then the fifth one is the one that's coming out any day, we hope. Uh, the hundreds of fermentation workshops he's taught around the world have helped to catalyze a broad revival of fermentation arts. And the New York Times has called Sandor, quote, one of the unlikely rock stars of the American food scene. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Dan and Sandor, and thanks everyone for being here. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Good evening, Sandor. Good evening, everybody. Thrilled to be here. This is, as I was just explaining to Sandor, uh, an opening night for me uh, at the restaurant, and we, this was planned uh, far in advance, my talk with Sandor, and when we realized we had to open tonight to some investors and uh, and some key people in Blue Hills ecosphere, I said, okay, but I'm doing this thing with Sandor because I believe so much both in Sandor Katz, but also in this book of his, which I cannot recommend more. Uh, I loved it. 
Uh, it's a tour of the world. Uh, and I just can't wait to talk to you about it. So I'm going to launch in with that. Uh, behind me, you might hear some noise, and I'm going to take the camera. See, there we are all preparing for this uh, first dinner service. And everyone is incredibly confused. And I just walked away. I said, guys, I'll be right back. Um, and here I am talking in sandal. Uh, so, you know, feeling very relaxed and uh, great to see you. Okay, well, it's so good to see you, and I feel so, um, um, you know, honored that you're, you know, taking time on this, you know, really um, um, important night. And and yeah. also, I'm just, I'm thrilled that you're um, so enthusiastic about my new book. I love it, and and so I just let's get right into it. I what, why did you write this book the way you did? And to, uh, you know, I'm not giving anything away, but for those who will, who will read this. Uh, it's a very different Sandor Katz book. It's really, um, it's a travel log. It's an educational manual. It's a history lesson. Uh, and I'm wondering what the process was uh, to do it. But even before that, uh, why write a book like this? Um, and, and why go around the world uh, to deepen your knowledge when you already, by the way, have a huge reservoir of knowledge? Well, um, you know, um... I mean, really, because there, because there's so much interest in fermentation, and um, you know, my earlier books, Wild Fermentation and The Art of Fermentation, you know, kind of came out just as this sort of new wave of interest in fermentation uh, uh, was um, was was emerging, was blossoming, was was growing. Um, you know, I've actually had the you know good fortune of being invited to teach. I mean, I've taught in maybe like 25 countries. And so, you know, most of the tr foods and beverages that I'm documenting are not so much places that I traveled to, to investigate, although there are a few of those, but mostly places where I found myself teaching. But of course, when I'm somewhere teaching, I'm not just teaching, I'm also eating and drinking. Um, and to the extent that I'm able to, I'm, I'm learning about, um, uh, you know, fermentation traditions in, in those places. So, um, you know, I've, I've just been extremely fortunate to get invited to teach in all these interesting places. And, um, and then I've gone to some other places that I was interested in to investigate. And, um, you know, fermentation is just, uh, you know, this, this huge realm of cultural practices. And it's not, a, you know, a unified set of processes. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very diverse. And, you know, any food we could possibly eat can be fermented. Fermentation is practiced everywhere. And and the particulars of how it's pre, pre, of 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 how it's practiced in different places are, are 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 different. And so, you know, as I was learning and taking notes and taking photographs, you know, I always had it in my mind that I was going to do a book like this. But I was too busy traveling, and um, you know, it was really it took a pandemic, and you know, having all of these travels be canceled, and you know, finding myself with uh, like a year with no plans that you know I had time to focus and uh, and 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 write this book. Um, and in terms of why I did it the way I did, I mean, originally I started out with the idea that I was going to do it in more of a, you know, classic travelogue style. You know, this was my trip to Japan. This was my trip to Brazil. Um, but, you know, well, one thing that, that I realized very quickly is that, you know, some parts of the world, I have had the opportunity to learn a lot about foods and beverages that I didn't know about before and other places, not as much. It was very asymmetrical when I tried to impose a geographic uh, uh, organization on it. And then, um, you know, I realized that what I love to do more than anything is connect the dots between disparate traditions. And I decided to, you know, organize it thematically and then jump around a little bit uh, 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 geographically as I was exploring, you know, different fermentation themes, the fermentation of different kinds of foods. What strikes me about when I was reading is just, I don't know if you felt this, but it's like so humbling if you're a chef or, or in your case, a ferment expert you realize just how much of this stuff was figured out thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, in like brilliant ways, you know, not just like haphazardly, uh, just by geniuses. Uh, 
to the point where it became so infused to the culture uh, that you forget that somebody actually in, had to trial and error this stuff. Uh, that's why, I mean, that's my broad takeaway from your book. It's just, yeah, there's like, what do I know? It's kind of what I yeah. felt. <laughs> well, and this is how I feel all the time. You know, when I, when I, you know, get to visit places and like, you know, learn about these foods I've never heard about. And they're just like completely integral to particular cultural practice. And, you know, I mean, there's certain plants that, you know, people's lives are organized around, you know, let's say um, cassava in the, in, 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 in the Amazon. And, you know, I mean, cassava is available all over the world. It's a, an important staple food in all of the tropical regions of the world. But, you know, the Amazon is where it comes from and where, you know, there are these, you know, really ancient cultural traditions organized around it and, and organized around, it, uh, around, you know, using the plant in so many different interlocking ways. So, like, you know, I document this, uh, you know, wonderful, like, uh, 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 food that I tried in Colombia called tukupi and tukupi is basically like the toxic juice of the cassava that's fermented and then cooked down into this uh, 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 paste that is just like so flavorful, umami, rich, beautiful. Um, but, but, but I mean, they're not just taking the juice. I mean, they're also using the fiber and every other part of the plant in, in other foods that, that are important. Uh, uh, right. And I, I read that and I was like, who is the guy or the woman, probably the woman who decided that's toxic, but if we do this, this, and this, we're going to make it delicious. Who, who is that person? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And I mean, presumably it's not one person, you know, it's like, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a series of experiments and, you know, I'm sure people realize that the juice was toxic and somehow realize that, Oh, if we ferment it, it's the smell takes, it smells different. And somebody was brave enough to taste it and like, it was safe to it. eat. Yeah. yeah. Russian roulette. I don't know. I mean, that's what happened with cucumbers, right? Cucumbers, wild cucumbers were toxic until there was some kind of uh, mutation and somebody tasted it. And all of a sudden they were breeding off of that. So that's true everywhere. But man, it's, you just, you just realize, God, there's some people out there doing some amazing stuff a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. Well, and also a lot of people, you know, today with our anxiety about bacteria project, uh, you know, anxiety onto these, you know, proven by time processes. And so, you know, they shred some cabbage, salt it and put it in a jar and then they stare at the jar and they, how do I know that there are good bacteria growing in there, not dangerous bacteria? Am I playing Russian roulette? But fermentation is not playing Russian roulette. Um, you know, these, these things are tested by time. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. I trust time more than scientists. I trust these populations, these cultures more than scientists. Uh, do you, who, like what, you mentioned cassava, what other ingredients do you think about when you, from this book that are memorable to you? I'm sure that there's so many, but it's- Well, I, I mean, I mean, everything. I mean, you know, I, I mean, sure, to some degree, you know, some of the things I'm writing about are ingredients that are specific to specific places. So for instance, you know, I write about uh, uh, pulque and mezcal in Mexico. And, you know, you can only make pulque or mezcal if you have maguey. So, you know, it's not that you at Blue Hill or me in Tennessee are going to be able to like replicate those specific foods. But I think that, you know, they inform our general understanding of what can be done. Um, um, and maybe we can find things around us that we can do similar things with. But really, most of the book is about more common ingredients that you can find anywhere. So, you know, for instance, I, I actually have here for show and tell, um, you know, two different forms of pickled daikon. So this is a daikon that's been pickling in my little um, uh, 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 crock of a turmeric paste. And so you can see that yellow color around the edge. I just, I just you know, cut, cut it uh, uh, crosswise. Um, um, but you can see sort of, you know, the, the, the color seeping into it. And this has only been fermented for four or five days. And, oh, I mean, it just has such a beautiful flavor already. So much turmeric sourness. It's lovely. This is a daikon radish that's been sitting in kasu, which is the byproduct of 
making sake. So it's uh, so it's it's the decomposed rice you know, along with all the organisms involved in fermenting the sake. And then I mix salt and sugar in the kasu mix. And this daikon has been sitting in it for 10 months. Um, and has a completely different kind of a flavor where, you know, things are caramelizing. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's developing a, you know, the, 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 the kinds of flavors that, 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 that fermentation can only create given long, long periods of time. So, you know, mostly the book is dealing with more, um, uh, you know, ingredients that, that that would be more widely available at the same time as I highlight some things that involve really specific ingredients that you find in specific parts of the world. Yeah, yeah. What about people? I mean, well, who stands out for you on the people that you met in this book? Some great oh, people. I mean, I've met so many wonderful people. I mean, on my first day in China, um, um, you know, landing in Chengdu, adjusting to the big time difference, the big cultural difference. We were just walking around with no agenda. I see these um, sausages hanging to cure outside of a ground floor apartment, uh, you know, just on a, on a street in a neighborhood near where we, were, where we were staying in Chengdu. I took out my phone. I take some pictures of it. The woman in the apartment sees me taking photos, comes out and talks to us. I mean, I don't speak Chinese, but luckily, I was traveling with three people who uh, uh, who spoke Chinese and, you know, they explained what we were doing. And she ended up inviting us in, giving us a like a pickle making lesson, feeding us lunch. Um, um, and it was like, you know, a beautiful start to our time in, in China. And I mean, she showed us not only how to make her pickles, but, you know, she showed us how she makes her chili oil. She showed us how she ferments tofu. Um, you know, it was really a, a very um, um, educational afternoon, you know, the, the following from this like totally, totally random encounter. And it was, you know, my curiosity about her sausages and taking a picture got her outside talking to us. Um, you know, I, I, I always think very fondly of my uh, uh, time in Colombia. Um, you know, I was, I was hosted by this, you know, very dynamic group of young people who have a, um, a, a, what they call El Talle de los, de los Fermentos, um, uh, which is a fermentation workshop where they, you know, produce some things that they sell and they hold educational events. But what was really most exciting about that is that, you know, they involved, um, uh, you know, they're plugged into an indigenous network and they involved indigenous people from the highlands, from um, um, the, the, the Amazon. So, um, um, you know, the, 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 the workshops where I was, you know, talking about basic concepts of fermentation, you know, turned turned into this exchange that was, you know, really, um, you know, exciting and, uh, and, and very, very interesting. Um, you know, I've taught, I mean, another like really wonderful place I taught was Majorca, the, 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 the Spanish Island of, uh, of, of, of Majorca. And we did the workshop on a farm, um, you know, where they're, you know, growing olives and making olive oil. And I, you know, learned about curing olives and, um, uh, um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, all, you know, all of my travels, you know, just end up having educational, uh, 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 components and, and, you know, the practice of fermentation is just so, um, you know, nearly infinite. I mean, I don't think it's possible that, you know, one person in one lifetime could like, you know, learn all ferments. I mean, there's a lot of variation. And the more, you know, the more I travel and the more I learn, the more I realize I'm just kind of scratching the surface that there's, you know, so many traditions and approaches that, you know, I, I, you know, haven't, haven't learned about. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a temptation to keep on collecting information until you have it all, but I'm never going to have it all. So, you know, it just seemed like a, like a good pause in my travels, a good opportunity to sort of share things that I've learned um, um, so far, but I'm, I'm looking forward to resuming my travels. And, um, uh, you know, I had, I had travels to Peru that got canceled due to the pandemic. I had travels to Iceland and, you know, I know that these places have, um, you know, really rich, vibrant fermentation traditions that I'd love to learn more about. The book to me was formatted a little bit like a sketchbook. Uh, I, I, I think, is that fair to say? And did you, what was your intention there? 
Well, um, I mean, sure. I, I mean, you know, I, I mean, just to, to, to explain to people, I mean, it, it's organized not unlike my earlier books about fermentation, kind of by fermentation substrates. So, you know, there's a chapter about simple sugars. There's a chapter about vegetables. There's a chapter about grains and starchy tubers, a chapter about mold cultures, beans and seeds, milk, meat and fish. Um, so I really, you know, I ended up organizing it by type of fermentation and, um, you know, let, let's, let's take the, the, you know, the section about, um, um, you know, beans and, uh, and seeds. I mean, you know, one food that I've been very interested in for a long time is, um, Japanese natto, the, the fermented whole soybeans, um, and, you know, what I've, what I've learned, um, uh, you know, over time, and it really kind of dawned on me slowly, is that natto is actually an import or, or natto-like foods are, you know, important flavors and components of cuisines far outside of Japan. And so I've had all these different encounters. You know, I've met, I met a, in Australia, I met a woman from Nagaland which is in the uh, uh, very uh, northeastern part of India. And um, uh, uh, they have something that they call akuni, which is soybeans fermented. And, 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 it, and it is a natto-like fermentation. Um, um, and then they're made into little packets and kind of smoked and dried in, 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 in that way. Yeah. Um, how, do you, how do you eat natto at home? Um, I, well, I mean, my favorite way to eat natto is, you know, basically uh, uh, on, a, on a bed of rice, I'll put some natto, um, I'll put some mustard, I'll put some vinegar, um, I'll put some chives, maybe little piece, strips of nori or something. Um, uh, sometimes I'll put a raw egg on that and then swirl it around um, um, to, to really like, you know, um, uh, make those big strings uh, uh, to emphasize the sliminess and then just like eat it with the rice. Like I love the sliminess of natto, but I, I you know, I didn't love it the first time I tried it. And I've learned that many people are put off by that. But, you know, in my kitchen every day, I'm using a natto based seasoning. This is what I call special sauce. It's natto, dried natto, uh, uh, ground up with sesame seeds and salt. And then sometimes I'll mix that with other seasonings. Like this is one with, with uh, caraway seeds and, uh, and chili peppers. Uh, what I found is that for many people, the flavor of natto is much more accessible if it's not wet and slimy, if it's dried and mixed with other things. And this is how it's used in a lot of places. Um, in Burma, there, there's, there are these dried little discs of um, um, natto and seasonings that you can buy uh, uh, in a market. And I've learned how to make them. And I've, you know, um, uh, uh, included that recipe in, in, in this book. Um, and throughout West Africa, there are um, uh, traditional condiments, not from soybeans, but from African locust beans and, and, and other legumes, but it's the same bacteria, Bacillus subtilis. So, you know, in African markets in the U.S., usually the name that it goes by is Dawa Dawa, uh, which is the Yoruba name, but it has lots of lots of different names, Sumbala, uh, uh, um, uh, um, lo lo lots of names, Afiti, um, um, but it has a very similar kind of a flavor to natto, but it's typically used dry and used as a sort of a, a, like a, a, a flavor base for, for stews. So, you know, I take a theme like that and I try to explore how similar foods manifest differently in different places. Yeah. The, the health benefits of something like that, well, all of this, but not to in particular, I've just been reading about it. Just, it's just incredible. Uh, it seems like an elixir for just about everything. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it's an extremely uh, uh, concentrated form of vitamin K2, and mm -hmm. it, has, um, it has this compound called natokinase that uh, basically can, can dissolve the fibers that sometimes build up in people's blood vessels and constrict circulation. So there's a lot of interest in it from a therapeutic standpoint, um, but it also packs a lot of flavor. And, you know, the thing is, I hear all the time from people who started eating it 
because, you know, they thought it might help their health. And then, you know, after forcing themselves to eat it a couple of times, they started to like the flavor and then they started to crave the flavor. And, you know, this is sometimes what's involved in like, you know, acquiring a taste for something is, you know, getting over your initial aversion and being willing to try it again. And I think having a motivation like that is a good reason to, to try something again. What's your very, uh, let's say, uh, unscientific viewpoint on post COVID on communities that rely on fermentation uh, as a as a large proponent of their l- large uh, a percentage of their diet. Uh, wh- what do you? I mean, what's your of all your travels and all your readings? What do you see around the world in terms of communities that that really do both very creative things with? fermentation and also have it as a mainstay in their diet? Well, I mean, I think almost everybody has it as as a mainstay in their diet. I mean, you know, you don't have to be, what's that? Not Americans. Well, what about coffee, bread, cheese? um, Okay, that's fair. (laughs) I, I mean, you know, not, not, not every fermentation is necessarily, you know, um, um, about, health consciousness. Um, You know, not every fermentation is, you know, sort of uh, wholesome or, you know, made in a way that you would want it to be. Um, But, you know, just as a practical matter, you know, people in every part of the world eat fermented foods and beverages every day. And, um, uh, you know, it's, 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 in a way, it's hard, you know, once you start take, you know, counting foods like that, it's hard to imagine a meal or a day without, you know, uh, uh, elements that are that that are fermented. Um, and I mean, certainly, I would say that there there are, um, you know, culinary traditions where fermentation is more prominent at the forefront. I mean, Japanese cuisine, Chinese cuisine, uh, uh, you know, Russian and Polish and other Eastern European cuisines. But, you know, really as a practical matter, you know, elements of fermentation are, are, are everywhere once you start looking at, you know, beverages, uh, dairy products, um, uh, you know, and, and, and also, especially once you start considering, um, um, you know, meat and fish absent refrigeration, you know, so like there's a section on the book about in, in the book about, you know, using rice to preserve fish and meat. And I think for a lot of, for a lot of, um, you know, Western readers, that's a shocking idea, uh, uh, the idea of fermenting fish and meat. But, you know, I mean, well, there are forms of it, certainly in, in, a, in a typical Western diet. I mean, you know, any kind of cured meat, you know, salami is, is, is fermented. I mean, most contemporary uh, uh, mass produced salami has starter cultures in it because the fermentation is such a, an essential part of um, uh, 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 the process. Um, but like, you know, so everyone knows about sushi. Sushi's gone global. It's everywhere. Like, would you eat sushi in a sushi restaurant that didn't have a refrigerator? Well, you know, up until a hundred years ago, there were no refrigerators. Um, so, um, uh, uh, you know, you could always have fresh sushi and, and, and cut it up from a fish that was alive, but sushi also has been a strategy for preserving fish in rice. And, and there's a, there's a whole sort of realm of sushi, um, um, that is Nara sushi, which is, you know, basically fish that has, that has been aged in a bed of rice and then eaten later. And, um, I have a recipe for one one example of that, kabura zushi, um, and um, and then I talk about a couple of other variations of that, uh, uh, as well as a Thai tradition nam of um, you know fermenting pork ribs or other kinds of meat in a paste of uh, uh, rice and garlic and salt. So I mean, sure, there are certain tradition, there are certain cultures with more prominent visible traditions of fermentation, but just as a practical matter, because all of the plants and all of the animal products that we eat are populated by microorganisms. I mean, fermentation has just been part of the picture everywhere, whether people were really thinking about it and making it a prominent part of the cuisine or if it was more incidental. Yeah. Where do you see Americans awakening as chefs, but now more and more people on this call, but home cooks, where do you see this all going? Well, what's the direction? What do you, what, what, how does this evolve? Well, I mean, 
I mean, my interest with my work is to, you know, give people the information that they need to be fermenting, whether that's, uh, you know, a, a, a prominent chef like yourself, or whether that's, you know, somebody who's just, you know, cooking for themselves and their family uh, 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 at home. And, um, you know, it's not that I think it's important that like everybody has to ferment for themselves, but anyone who has the vaguest interest in it, you know, I, I, I think should feel empowered to, to, to do it. And I think it's, you know, it's very fun and satisfying for people to, you know, make delicious things and, and share delicious food. And, um, you know, because fermentation has this component of time involved, I think that, um, um, you know, there's, there's even greater significance when people are sharing things that they've fermented with someone. It means they've really, you know, invested a lot of time and, and, and energy. Um, and, and um, you know, fermentation creates some of the greatest delicacies of, of the world. Um, I'm also interested in people just becoming more aware about the foods that they're eating. And, and, uh, you know, I think that, I think it's just, it's, it's happening in our culture that more and more people are, um, um, you know, interrogating their food and wanting to know where, where did that come from? By what processes was that created? And once you start interrogating your food like that, fermentation is just always part part of the answer. So, I mean, my interest is in empowering people and helping people become, you know, sort of more aware of this process that is, you know, so widespread and so um, diverse. And yet at the same time, it's been so obscured and so mystified. Yeah. But you, I, I mean, you see, I mean, like 10 years, 10 years ago versus what you're seeing today in America is, is I mean, it's just a sea change, right? I mean, you, you agree with that or you? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, I think that, I think it's a sea change in terms of awareness Thank and you. thinking well, about. A large part to the work you, you did, but yes, go ahead. But, but, but I think that, um, I mean, I think if we look at what people actually eat, I think like in our great grandparents' time, people were eating and drinking just as much fermented stuff as they are now. I mean, you know, beer, I mean, you know, okay, we're going through a great beer moment right now. There's all of these microbreweries making, you know, you know, really interesting styles of beer, but you know, in our great grandparents time, beer was widely and commonly available. Wine was widely and commonly available. Bread was widely and commonly available. Cheese was widely and commonly available. So, I mean, I think the major products of fermentation, you, you know, have really enjoyed enduring popularity. And the thing that we're seeing changing right now is an awareness and an interest in that. And, um, you know, People like yourself who, uh, you know, have a culinary platform, like wanting to incorporate, you know, in-house fermentation in that. And, you know, people in home kitchens just doing simple things like making sauerkraut or, you know, um, um, uh, starting a sourdough and, 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 you know, making bread once a week from a sourdough starter. I mean, I think that there are a lot of people, you know, with a, with a casual interest in this that are, you know, getting excited about this as, um, um, you know, as a, as a way to feed their family, as a way to preserve things from their garden, as a, um, um, you know, as, 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 as a hobby, something that they find fun and satisfying. I think that there's a, you know, as a health practice for people interested in, you know, probiotics or, um, um, you know, some of the other benefits of, of fermented foods. Um, you know, one thing that I wish would change is some of the, um, uh, you know, regulatory schemes that make it so difficult for, um, you know, Just let's say resta to. Let, yeah. for restaurants to do in-house fermentation, you know, we're sort of stuck on this idea that food that has sat between 40 degrees Fahrenheit and 140 degrees Fahrenheit for more than four hours is dangerous and we have to throw it out. And that describes just about every fermented food or beverage, um, you know, sits in that temperature range for um, um, more than four hours. And and, you know, it makes the food safer, not more dangerous. Right. Everything I always say, everything I want to do with food is illegal. <laughs> but but you know, laws change when the culture shifts. I mean, part of the reason the laws are that way is because the culture is that way, right? So, uh, you know, the, these things will, these things seem to me will evolve because the cultural pressure will make them evolve. But uh, you know, I've also yeah, got food inspectors that I've got to <laughs> make sure I'm careful of.
uh, but at home you don't. So that's nice. What what experiments are you doing now that you're most looking forward to seeing the results of? Well, um, um, it's funny you should ask because I just uh, uh, I, I just took out of my incubator on my porch. Um, this is um, chestnuts that I'm growing koji on. Um, and so I have three chestnut trees outside of my house. This time of year, I'm, I'm harvesting chestnuts every day. And uh, yesterday, I, I steamed these chestnuts. Uh, I cut them in half. I, I steamed them. I got them out of their shells. Um, uh, I cooled them down. I added a little bit of roasted chestnut flour just to dry them out a little bit. And then I added my koji starter. And they've been sitting in my incubator uh, at around 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And now they're generating heat. Um, I mean, my the thermometer in them is reading 97 degrees. Um, um, so, you know, the, 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 the fungus is growing. And then tomorrow I'm going to, when, when this is done, I'm going to use it to make what's called shio koji, salt koji, which is, you know, basically I'll mix it with water and salt, ferment it in that uh, uh, form for a couple of weeks. Then I'll put it in the blender and then I'll have this like paste that's rich in all these enzymes that I'll use for marinating things and, and seasoning things. And it'll, it'll be the flavor of chestnut enhanced by Koji. Um, um, and I'm super excited about that. Yeah. Now that actually sounds incredibly delicious and I might follow your lead with that one uh, and, and do that in my own kitchen. We've got a bunch of experiments going that, uh, that I'm excited for. And I hope you'll come visit me at Blue Hill now that we're reopening and, uh, have you see how you've influenced us in all these different ways and this new book uh, for everyone who's listening i cannot I've given I bought five copies it's in the kitchen on in what our library in the corner and i'm making all the cooks who now joined us for this reopening to read it because it's a it's a as you say a tour de force um i'm gonna i i'm gonna say good night to you sandor and i'm sorry to leave you early it, it, amazing that i would leave sandor cats 20 minutes early but i have to go and uh, cook for, uh, I said, my investors and some key people for the restaurant are here tonight to taste the first uh, uh, Blue Hill uh, 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 R&D dishes since we left for COVID a year, more than a year and a half ago. So uh, I hope you'll excuse me. I'm sorry okay. uh, for doing and that. a lot of questions. So I, I know we can turn it over to you guys to go through some of these Q&A questions. Thanks the, so uh, much. Dan, and I don't know if you have 30 seconds to answer one question that was aimed yeah. at you, which is which is a segue from what you were just talking about. Are there any fermented dishes on the menu tonight or anything? Do you want to share any information about some of those experiments that you've got going before you dash off? Or oh, yeah. No, I mean, I share everything. I'm open book. Uh, how could I not be? I mean, I've learned everything from Sandor. And so I, everything, I, everything I build on that or, or go in a direction, uh, we're always sharing with it. But I'm just looking at the kitchen and... Um, uh, I just used a shio koji um, to with uh, with anchovies uh, and and uh, shallots, and I made this vinaigrette that uh, I had sitting since about five o'clock, and I'm going out to taste it now because I'm I've got these overgrown collard greens out in the field, and I'm I I never know what do you do with overgrown collard greens except you braise them for a very long time and they break down. Um, but I was trying now, we did an experiment with dehydrating them a little bit and then frying them in a tempura. So we've got like, it's beautiful. I wish I'd shown it to you. Oh, that plate. sounds great. It's a collard green plate. And that's what it is. And it's, it's so tasty. And so I, I'm going to rub this, hopefully rub this vinaigrette on it and then build some kind of salad on it. That's, and that's the next course. So I'm, I'm running, but uh, thank you all very much for uh, joining this and uh, carry on. And um, Sandra, I'm wishing you a lot of luck with this book. Okay, thank you. I'm 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 so honored that you took time out. Have a great night, and uh, uh, next time I'm around New York, I will certainly be in touch. I hope so. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks very Bye, much. Everyone. Man. Appreciate it. Well, we do have some some questions that it would, this is the perfect uh, time to move into those, and one of them actually. A, couple people were interested specifically in African ferments. And I know you mentioned the, the natto relative, I think that you, that, that you discovered in Africa, but a couple, someone asks, are there any Christopher Renfro, are there any African fermented drinks or foods you know of? And Kate asked if I, are there anything, anything that you especially wish American eaters would be more familiar with or anything that really mm. sticks with you from your travels in Africa specifically? 
Well, okay. So, so, so let me, I mean, I have, I have traveled in Africa. It was before I was specifically interested in fermentation. When I was 23 years old, I, uh, I crossed the Sahara desert and, uh, traveled in West Africa. And, uh, you know, as, as I write in this book, and as I alluded to in, in, in my earlier books, um, you know, I wasn't focused on fermentation. I wasn't asking questions about fermentation, but I did encounter, um, you know, the first, uh, uh, you know, non-factory alcoholic beverages that, that I ever had encountered there. And, um, uh, you know, it was palm wine and also millet beer. Um, and, uh, and, you know, these were, you know, these, it was always out of an open vessel, not out of a bottle that was sealed with a label on it. And, um, you know, I understood them to be homemade. Sometimes they were shared as an expression of hospitality. Other times there was a little stand and when we would like buy a glass and, 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 and drink it. Um, but, you know, then when I did get specifically interested in fermentation about 10 years later, and I started looking through the you know, the hobby literature that exists in the US for, you know, how to make wine and how to make beer, I found myself very put off by all of the technological assumptions. Like, you know, you needed a specific kind of a vessel, a carboy with an airlock, and you needed all these chemicals to sanitize everything. And you needed to buy special strains of yeast. And, you know, I found myself wondering as I was reading those books, you know, I wonder where the people in those villages where we had palm wine were getting equipment like that. Um, and, you know, or is there some way that you can do this without all of that equipment? And so, you know, I would just say that that experience uh, of, um, you know, traveling in, in West Africa, you know, made me ask questions that I would not have known to ask otherwise. So I think that, you know, my, my investigations of fermentation are certainly informed by that experience. Um, now I love the food when I was in West Africa. Um, um, uh, but I didn't know that much about it. I mean, I didn't realize that this sort of underlying flavor of the stews was a flavor of fermentation. It wasn't until I read about Dawa Dawa and Sumbala. Um, and then, you know, I, at one point at a sustainable agriculture conference in North Carolina, I actually met a, a, a guy who had migrated um, from Senegal to the U.S. And he brought me... So, on the second day of the conference, you know, he, I mean, he was so surprised that I'd ever heard of, of the ferments um, uh, uh, from West Africa that he brought me some uh, um, uh, Sumbala that he had picked up on, on, on a trip home. Um, and so I had some to play with. And then I was like, oh, this is kind of a familiar flavor. And I realized that, you know, that I indeed had eaten um, um, uh, these stews decades earlier that, that, that had this as an underlying flavor. I've written in my earlier books about injera, about Te, uh, tej, which is uh, uh, honey wine. Um, uh, I wrote in Art of Fermentation about um, uh, sorghum beers. So, I mean, in my in in each of my books, I mean, I've written about you know some um, um, African uh, 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 ferments. In this one, I really focus on the sumbala, dawa dawa, these uh, sort of fermented legume uh, 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 condiments. But I mean, you know. I know from literature, um, you know, there's an excellent book about um, uh, Sudanese ferments uh, written by an anthropologist there documenting, you know, nearly 100 distinct uh, uh, fermentation processes in that single country uh, alone. Um, and, you know, all, all across Africa, there are rich traditions of fermentation as there are everywhere. Um, now, there's a question about, um, you know, me, w w what I wish people would know about. Um, I don't know, you know, I mean, I don't, I'm not really a person who thinks that there's like cultural literacy tests and that like everybody has to sort of know about a particular set of, 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 of things. I mean, you know, the biggest thing I want people to know is that, you know, first of all, all of us are eating fermented foods and beverages on a daily basis. I mean, I meet people all the time. They hear what I do. They make a face like, Oh, fermentation. I hate fermented foods. And, you know, they're thinking of, you know, one fermented 
fermented food that was too strong for them that, that they didn't like, and they just think, oh, that's fermentation. And then when I point out to them that, you know, bread is fermented and cheese is fermented and coffee is fermented and chocolate is fermented, you know, then they're like, oh, oh, I guess I don't hate all fermented foods. So, you know, I, I, I wish people would recognize more of the foods that they're already eating and loving that involve fermentation. And I wish that people wouldn't project all of their anxiety about bacteria onto fermentation. And, you know, imagine that their, you know, their jar of sauerkraut or their country wine, you know, they might inadvertently be making something, you know, really poisonous that's going to, that's going to kill somebody. And, you know, fermentation is a strategy strategy for safety. It makes food safer. It doesn't make food more dangerous. And that's not to say that you can't get something wrong and create something that could potentially be dangerous, but you have to get it really wrong. And like the number one thing is you need to understand what kind of conditions you're trying to create. And as long as you have a basic understanding of that, you're not going to create something that's dangerous. Right. Um, the questions are rolling in here. So I'm, uh, one, the one's from Corey Hewart, who says, hi, Sandor, maybe someone you know, and, hi, Corey. Ask, and asks, uh, how much of this, quote, fermentation revival do you see happening in non-Western countries as compared with the U.S. or the West? And was fermentation, you know, falling, quote, out of fashion in the same way it, it is perceived to have been here until recently? And you've kind of addressed that, that that it actually never really was out of fashion, but maybe there was a perception. And do, does it feel like there's a revival? Is the revival global or is that kind of a U.S. thing? I, no, it's definitely not a U.S. thing. I, I mean, you know, um, uh, I mean, I don't I, I don't know that it's the same everywhere. I don't think that it's the same everywhere, but it's certainly not limited to the U.S. or, or even to the West. I mean, you know, sometime last summer, I participated in this amazing week long uh, uh, fermentation event in India. And, you know, it was people from all around India, um, you know, presenting on different, um, um, you know, traditional fermented foods and beverages and, um, you know, and it was amazing. And so, um, um, you know, that, that certainly clued me into, um, um, you know, a, a growing interest in, in fermented foods and beverages in India. Um, now, in terms of the question of it, of, of it falling out of practice, I mean, you know, in places, I mean, in, in Japan and in China, in both places where fermentation remains a very important part of people's diets, I mean, still fewer people are practicing at home. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, the idea of food being mass produced is not unique to um, uh, the United States or, or, or the West. I mean, it's sort of like, you know, it's, it's a global phenomenon, the, you know, the centralization of, of food production and, you know, the corollary to food production becoming centralized is that fewer people are practicing it. You know, there's less people who are, you know, doing, you know, making yogurt in the house, um, um, you know, making their own pickles, making their own, um, um, uh, um, uh, sausages or, you know, whatever. And um, I mean, certainly in China, most of the people who I met who were doing their own fermentation at home were older people. And some of them commented on, you know, the fact that, that some of the younger generation isn't that interested in learning. It made me think about like, you know, my, my mother not being interested in like learning some of the old country dishes that my grandmother used to make. Uh, you know, she just was like, I'm not going to spend all day in the kitchen the way my mother did. Um, so I think that, you know, there is the allure of convenience and that's not unique to, to the U.S. And I think that there's just fewer people practicing fermentation in the home. And at the same time, there's, you know, some, you know, next generation people who are like, let's bring this back. The things that my grandma made were, were, were wonderful and we don't want to lose them. So, I mean, in China, I met back to the landers, you know, people who had like met in Wuhan where they grew up and then they moved to a rural area. They were living in a yurt. I mean, you know, it could have been people I would meet in, you know, in Vermont or in Tennessee. You know, they're living in a yurt. They're homeschooling their kids. They have a garden and they wanted to make, and it was important to them to make 
make their own pickles. So I think that, you know, sure. I mean, we have, you know, mass marketing, mass production happening everywhere. And that means fewer people are making things at home, but there are growing movements um, um, in a lot of places to, you know, not lose the tradition, not lose the, you know, the skills and the ancestral wisdom. Great. Uh, some practical, very kind of practical questions coming in. And again, they're coming in in pairs. It seems like two people are, are think have mushrooms on their mind. It being as we, as we come into fall here, one person, Cassidy Metcalf asks, asks whether you know of any culture that ferments wild harvested mushrooms. And yes, Alice, yes, and, yes. And Allison yes. Everhart asks, it says it's an amazing year for mushroom hunting in the Northeast. Any new ideas that you could share on fermenting mushrooms? Well, sure. I mean, okay, the, where, where, where you got to look for mushroom fermentation is uh, Slavic cultures, you know, Russian culture and, 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 and the other and, 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 and the neighboring Slavic lands. And, you know, they just have incredible traditions of fermenting mushrooms. And generally what they're doing is just layering mushrooms, salt, mushrooms, salt, weight, not adding any water, um, you know, just just letting the salt pull juice out of the mushrooms and then fermenting them, you know, just like vegetables, basically. You get a lactic acid fermentation of, of the mushrooms. Um, you know, I know it's done with certain types of mushrooms and not as much with other types of mushrooms. Um, I actually came across a, a few years ago um, an article and maybe it was an ethnobotany journal, but it was specifically about, um, uh, it was a review of the literature of fermenting mushrooms. And I put a link of it up on my website. So my website is wildfermentation.com. And if you go to the um, uh, 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 fermentation resources links, and then follow that to vegetable fermentation links, um, uh, you'll find this article about, about mushroom fermentation, but you can experiment with different mushrooms. You know, if, if there's some mushroom you have an abundance of, try what I just said, like just layer mushrooms and lightly salt them. Mushrooms, lightly salt them, put a heavy weight on it, protected from flies, fermented for a few weeks, see what happens. Great. And then, well, let me say one other thing is you can also do a hybrid thing. This is mostly what I've done with mushrooms. Like when I've had a big flush of shiitake mushrooms, I'll mix it with cabbage and ferment it like in a kraut. Wow. And that's like a beautiful, like textural variation for the kraut. It really maintains the, like the meatiness of a fresh shiitake mushroom in a beautiful way. Nice. A couple other questions that may be referring people to the resources on wildfermentation.com, but one person asking, is there a place to get a guide to build a home fermenter? Not sure what, if they mean an incubator or, but some kind of a, I mean, is there a good place for DIY people who want to build fermentation? Yeah, tools? sure. So like, um, uh, I, I probably talk about a little bit in the art of fermentation too, but definitely in, in fermentation journeys at the beginning of the section of growing mold cultures, I, you know, I, I have a general discussion of different, you know, sort of styles of incubators that I have um, uh, uh, seen in, in home practice. Um, I'll briefly describe what, what I do for mine. I basically uh, um, I, I, I was buying some piece of kitchen equipment and I saw an old refrigerator on the loading dock and I was like, what's that? Are you throwing that away? And they were throwing it away and they let me take this defunct commercial refrigerator and I have it on my porch and I took the compressor off. I drilled a few extra holes in the bottom for air circulation. I have a simple clamp light bulb fixture, light fixture with an incandescent light bulb, like a 75 watt bulb uh, at the bottom of it. And then I have that plugged into this temperature controller. That's kind of the, the hardest part of it. But it, it, there's a company making beautiful ones now. Um, um, uh, uh, um, Inkbird is the name of the company. And it's basically, it's, it's got a temperature sensor and two plugs. 
and a little LED that you can control. And you just set your target temperature and you plug the light bulb into where it says heating on there. And anytime the temperature gets below the temperature you set, it'll just turn on the incandescent light bulb at the bottom of the incubator and heat up the whole space until the temperature sensor at the top reaches the target temperature and then it'll turn the light bulb off. So, you know, that, 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 that's what I have is an improvisational system. I do know that there are some companies given the, given the, you know, explosion of interest in fermentation that are, you know, creating dedicated incubators that you can just set the temperature at and it will, you know, go to that, go to that temperature. I, I mean, I haven't seen something like that. I haven't, I have no idea what, 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 what they cost. I think for most people, an improvisational setup probably makes more sense, but um, you know, these, these kinds of things are beginning to be produced. Um, I should just tell a funny story that I, that I, that I tell in fermentation journeys, but um when I visited Japan, I mean, I got to visit this amazing brewery where they're doing everything in just like really traditional ways. They don't use pure culture starters. They're doing everything by hand. It's called Terada Honke. I have like some beautiful photos from there in the book. But then I also visited this other uh, uh, brewery outside of Kyoto where like they had this robotic koji making machine. So, you know, it had temperature sensors, carbon dioxide temperature. Uh, uh, sensors, humidity sensors, and then it had these robotic arms. So if it started building up too much heat in the center, like what I do when I'm making a tray of tempeh is I take it out, I check the temperature. If it's hot, I, I go through, I clean my hands and I go through with my hands and I break up the clumps. Well, this robotic machine, you didn't have to have a worker doing that. You know, it just had these robotic hands that would come and break up the clumps and mix it all around. Um, so, so, you know, there, 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 there is lots of potential technology. I typically prefer to do things in, you know, lower tech, more improvisational ways. Got it. One quick follow-up to that. Adam is asking if, should there be a fan in, in, on that refrigerator thing that you built? Is, should there be a fan inside as well? Or does the heat produce enough airflow? Do you, I, I I do have not used a, a a fan. I mean, what you generally don't want to do when you're making koji or tempeh, which are the two main things that I do in this, is dry them out. So you wouldn't really have a want to have a fan blowing on it. If you had an exhaust fan, that wouldn't be a terrible thing. But I haven't really found it to be necessary at the scale at which I'm using it. Great. We're getting to time here. I want to try to squeeze it. If you're game, Sandra. Yeah, no, I'm game to do a few more. Yeah hang out for a bit. Uh, just We've just got a few questions here and I think we can just about squeeze them in. Uh, Trip Sweeney asks, he's interested in the in the special spice blends that you, you've mentioned a couple of which tonight and asks whether you share those in your books or is there a spice blends index or if he's mm. interested in, in replicating that at home, how would he do that? Yeah, I mean, my new book that we're talking about that sadly won't be available for a couple of more weeks. Uh, I have a whole section about special sauce and I, you know, I talk about my base recipe and I talk about some of the variations that I've made and um, um, my friend Soiree, who, who is who is watching, has made other flavors that she shared with me. So, you know, don't take my flavors, especially with something like a spice blend, but really with any of my recipes as the last word. You know, I'm just trying to explain how how I did it and give you a sense of proportions, but, um, you know, I mean, play, play with all these things and, and make them your own and find, find new, uh, 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 uh variation. So yeah, I talked about special sauce, which is, um, the, the, these, these dried natto That's blends. Natto. Yeah. And so it's basically natto, usually one part natto, two parts sesame seeds, salt to taste and some that's the base and then then sometimes i'll add other other seasonings to uh, uh augment that i love the coriander seed one uh, i love the caraway seed one i love putting Sichuan peppercorns and chilies in with it um um but um uh you know there's there's infinite possibilities with that the other spice blend that i guess i mentioned is the perpetual pickling uh, uh turmeric turmeric uh, uh uh pickles so yeah that recipe is absolutely uh, 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 in the book. Great. A couple of people asking about salt related questions. One is uh, Adam saying, if you're not sure about the salt content for a ferment, where's a good place to start? And 
And then Nancy Lambert raising the question, she says, I worry about the high sodium content of many ferments. Are there any health impacts to be concerned about high blood pressure, et cetera, on communities with a, or on communities with a fermentation emphasis in their cuisine? Is that a factor that needs to be looked at? Well, sure. I mean, you know, to me, the salt level, you know, dictates, you know, how much I would want to eat of something. So, you know, I might taste something very salty. Let's, let's take soy sauce, an example, or fish sauce. You know, these are, you know, very salty fermented uh, uh, condiments. So you're like, you're not going to drink them by the glass. That would be too much salt. So, you know, that, that, that sort of dictates that you use just a little bit of them. Let's say, um, you know, you come from a family where your grandparents were making sauerkraut and they learned how to make sauerkraut from their grandparents. Probably they made a very salty sauerkraut because you go back just a few generations and, you know, this is a serious survival food. These might be the last vegetables that people would see for months. And so, you know, they had a good incentive to use a lot of salt. But if you're, you know, if you're watching this and you're living in the year 2021, um, um, you know, probably those vegetables are not the last vegetables that you're going to be seeing for the next months. And so you could make your sauerkraut much lower salt. I make very low salt sauerkraut. Um, you know, I, but, but rather than, you know, giving people a fixed percentage of salt in my sauerkraut recipes, I, I like to, I like to recommend you lightly salt your vegetables as you're shredding them up and then mix it all up and taste it. It's always easier to add more salt to taste than to take salt away. So, um, um, you know, uh, um, when I'm going to be storing it in a cool place, uh, you know, not necessarily for months and months, I'll use exceedingly small amounts of salt, maybe a half a percent or 1% salt. And then, I mean, actually the other day I was like, I, I was, I was, I was jarring up some sauerkraut and I had like, you know, two cups of sauerkraut juice, but it was very low salt. And I just, I had a sip and it was so good. I drank the whole two cups of sauerkraut juice. And if it was significantly salty, I just wouldn't have done that and couldn't have done that. So, I mean, you know, there just are no fixed salt percentages in this. And in fact, I mean, I write, I, I write in here about this, um, uh, a town uh, uh, that my friend in Japan took me to um, um, where they have a tradition of, of fermenting vegetables without any salt at all. Like salt is not absolutely essential, at least for a vegetable fermentation. I would say once you get into like legumes, miso like things, salt is essential. Um, um, and sometimes significant amounts of salt are, are essential, you know, ba basically to um, prevent putrefaction faction to make sure that you're getting a desirable fermentation. It's a way of narrowing the range of organisms that they can, they can grow. But in the fermentation of vegetables, I mean, salt, you know, helps um, uh, especially keep the texture good. Um, um, you know, vegetables can, can get very soft and mushy um, uh, due to enzyme activity and the salt inhibits the enzymes. So, you know, so there, 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 there can be trade-offs, but, um, but I think that, you know, I, I cannot think of a ferment that cannot be adapted to, uh, you know, some sort of a lower salt version. And what I would say, you know, I mean, really for anybody, not only people who already have a problem with high blood pressure is, you know, moderation is good. And if a food is extremely salty, that's an indication that you should eat just a little bit of it. Great. Here's a question I like. Do you have a favorite use of fermentation in dessert? And I guess, of course, you could you could talk about chocolate and but in just yeah, in yeah. terms of kind of more exotic, like from well, I mean, you know, in the book, I have a recipe for sauerkraut chocolate cake, um, um, which is, you know, which is amazing. Um, um, I also have a recipe for, um, um, uh, oh, am I going to blank on the name of it? Uh, uh, Indonesian, uh, um, hold on one second, um, Tape. So, I mean, I, I experienced this when I was teaching in, in, um, in, in Bali, in Indonesia, but, um, uh, you know, they would, they, they, they steamed um, uh, cassava and rice, and then they used um, banana leaves, 
And then they sprinkled a little starter that's, you know, sort of the equivalent of Koji um, um, onto them and then just left them in a warm place for a few days and they got intensely sweet. And they, if you left it longer, it would become alcoholic, but they were just looking for the complex carbohydrates to break down into simple sugars to make a dessert. So, you know, it was sort of something like amazake where, you know, you're using koji to make the rice sweet. So, I mean, amazake can be almost like sickeningly sweet and there's no sugar added. It's just from the breakdown of the carbohydrates, you know, due to the, um, uh, the, the, the enzymes in, in, in the koji. So yeah, there are interesting dessert applications of fermentation. I just see in the chat, somebody asked a, a question about whole cabbage sauerkraut. So yeah, I mean, especially in the Southwest of Europe, uh, I saw it in Croatia, but, but I think in, in most of the former Yugoslavia lands, um, you know, the, the, the predominant tradition is for people to ferment cabbages whole. And I have a, I have a little section in the book where I talk about, you know, techniques that I learned in Croatia for um, uh, fermenting whole heads of cabbage and also a recipe for sarma, which is a stuffed cabbage dish, which is, you know, you, when, once you have the whole head of cabbage, then you can just peel off whole leaves and they're pliable. They won't, they won't crack when you, when you try to fold them. So it's a great way to, 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 to do stuffed cabbage as well. Great. Well, that's pretty much it on questions. And we've, we've run 10 minutes over or so. So I think it's a good time to wrap it up. And I'm here on the West coast and I'm getting hungry with all this talk about food. So. Okay. And I'm here in central time and I'm getting hungry too. I bet you are. <laughs> um, so thanks everyone. Again, thank you to the five uh, bookstores who co-sponsored this. For people who joined us late or didn't hear, I wanted to remind people that there is going to be a recording of this. So if you miss some of it, um, that will be sent out to all the sponsoring bookstores. They should have it um, available. It'll also be on our YouTube channel, um, but please feel free to, to check it out if you missed some of it. And just a reminder that the, that the book is called Sandor Katz's Fermentation Journeys. You can hold up that, that arc that you've got there, Sandor, which is an imperfect representation of what the finished product's gonna look like. But it, and again, our apologies for the delays associated with it, but we will have it to bookstores, hopefully by the end of October, maybe slightly before. And please do support your, Support your small independent bookstores. They need they need the love too. And and Sandor, thanks so much as always. It was it was great. And, well, thank uh, you, thank you, Michael. Thank you, bookstores. Thank you, Dan Barber, for taking yes. time on this like you know really important night. Yeah, great. Take care, everyone, and thanks for thanks for being here.